So I think I'll, so. I'm going to continue on on talking about talking about this, but I'm going to give you a little explanation about why I'm doing it first. Um, uh, so far, we, and last one time only, we did uh, uh, the, the, these. Now, are when we do the for those of you who, who were not here last time, um, when we had the full moon ceremony, uh, then um, uh, we um, uh, we at the end of it, then we then we take the precepts, and then you everyone recites the precept. And then I and then Mike using in my case, then I say what Dogen said, which is on the which is which is on which is as it were on the script here. Okay, um, uh, but the the reason I'm I'm um, uh, Paul you know Paul Disco is not here today, but you've seen Paul. Paul's a is a friend of ours from, from a long time ago, from the 1967. Uh, and we've known him all along during that time too. He's a person, that, as you know, built the built built the zendo and here and built the built the built the thing in the middle and gave us the the han that we had hit during us during a zazenka uh, sashins. Anyway, Paul he Paul once asked Suzuki Roshi, and he said this I think last time he was here. He asked Suzuki Roshi, "What is the most some question like? I don't know what it is at all, but it was a question anyway." So, like a question that would be sort of like, what's the most important thing? Or what's the most important thing I can learn or something like that to, uh, to Suzuki Roshi. And Suzuki Roshi said just three words. He said, don't make two. Don't make two. And this is what Dogen is doing here. Dogen is doing exactly that. He's not making two which is to say he's showing the precept is not about the, the precepts are are about things that is better that you didn't do uh but 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 more but and what dogan adds is but so dogan takes the precepts and he does that exactly he makes them not too Uh, let me. I'd like, I'd like to give a, a word on Dogen here too. Also, um, uh, of course, Dogen is our founder of Soto Zen in Japan, which which Jane and I came from because of Suzuki Roshi. Only reason because of Suzuki Roshi. Um, but um, uh, so he's important because he's the founder. But like George Washington is a founder, or Abraham Lincoln was a well kind of founder. That founder part is not important. Not important at all. Okay. I'm, I, I talk about Dogen because not because he's important, but because I'm saying to you, you can trust him. If you read his words, you will not find anything wrong. I can't vouch for myself that way, but I can vouch for Dogen. Okay. I'm sure I often have to kind of guess what these things mean. And I'm guessing sometimes. I think it's the best answer, but it may not be the answer. This happens a lot with uh, other teachers. But I wanted you to know that you are not just reciting something when you're doing the full moon ceremony. Not just a ritual. It's not, it is a ritual, but there's a meaning behind it. And the meaning is what's most important. And Dogen provides the meaning of what we should do. Okay? Okay? So therefore, you can use the truth that Dogen has in your practice. As you know, you've heard here many times from Jane and myself both. To, uh, um, uh, the last thing, one of the last things that uh, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was, was reputed to have said is, don't put another head above your own. Don't put, do, don't put me above, of course me is easy to do, but don't put Dogen above your own either. He's only useful because he tells the truth. And the truth is of use to us. So that's why I'm doing this. It's maybe a little hard to understand at times. But anyway, so I'll start now. Um, so far, last time we did uh, the, the, the three pure precepts. I vow to refrain from all evil. I like to say, I vow to refrain from, all, from not doing good or doing what is bad. 
I vow to make every effort to live in enlightenment. I vow to live and be lived for the benefit of all beings. Those are the, 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 the three pure precepts that kind of map out our practice for us. And then I went to the first of the grave, pre, so-called grave precepts on our list here. They're, they are prohibitive, okay? But the point, and, and, and the point of precepts is, once again, I have, is that you should be, you, you, these are things that you shouldn't do because you're hurting yourself. And you won't, you won't, you won't get it if you keep doing these things. So, and, but it's also a way, you know, to, that we have right from the start is how you study Buddhism is to study the self. The, the Buddhism is always about the self. And, but what the self is, is another story. But that's what Buddhism is about. Not about anything else. It's about the self. It's about what's real. Okay, so, so today <clears throat> I'm going to do uh, number, the second, third, and fourth precept. I'm in the wrong, wrong section of my paper here. One second. Here. Okay, here I am. No? Here I am. Okay. So, for the second prohibitive precept, I not to, I vow not to take what is not given. Now we we usually say don't steal. Okay. But anyway, it's, it's expressed that way, which is more, kind of nicer. Okay. And then Dogen says, first you say, you, you, you recite, we all recite, I vow not to take what is not given. And then the response of Dogen is, the self and objects are such as they are. Two, yet one. There we go again, see, two, yet one. The gate of liberation stands open. Repeating it, the self and objects are such as they are. Two, yet one, the gate of liberation stands open. Subject and object are here. <clears throat> and in the simple sentence, I love you, for example, I is the subject and you is the object. So in ordinary life, we, the subjects, naturally have things, the objects, that we wish to obtain. Our body needs us to take care of it with fluids and nourishment, as well as comfort and safety. However, our small self getting involved in the process can lead to karmic consequences. The precepts are all about our small selves. Dogen talks about, well, this, this, it's not the small self only, it's the big self. So he tells you the, the, the big self, but the precept tells you the small self. When, now, so, there are, so our small self getting involved in the process can lead to karmic consequences. When merely thinking of ourselves, such as in wanting just because we do, wanting something just because we do, we suffer when we don't get it. You know this. This is equally true for when we don't want something that we have. However, once we get something, we, we want, its allure can soon wear off, and we may find ourselves quickly desiring something else. So we're always chasing something. This appears in the Genjo Koan. Practice that confirms things by bringing the self to them is illusion. For things to come forward and confirm the self is enlightenment. That's quite heady. Practice that confirms things by bringing the self to them, making two out of, out, 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 out of everything, is you and what you want. But things, but the real truth is, we should allow things to come forward, and they can confirm who we are. That is enlightenment. Wanting something and going after it to fulfill the desires of the small self is to make real what really isn't, and as such is a deluded action. Bringing the self to them is us trying to make them 
ours. When not thinking of ourselves, when dealing with what is in front of us, but allowing, quote, quote, things to come forward and confirm the self, is accepting the world of others into ours. Their worlds then become our world. And this is living in enlightenment. For then we and others are one. Our inside and outside are not different. In living to help like this, you know, we're talking about people having people having problems, or you want to help people and help people here. We don't suffer from it because we don't lose ourselves. We are as as we are in this case not not caring about and us for this to happen to nor are we sacrificing anything and not thinking about ourselves we are complete as we are that's the one and so not in need of anything else and so have no desire to take what is not given that's a quote to take what is not given with no self getting in the way, the gate of liberation stands open, as we and others can be one. That's number, th that's number two. Number three is, I vow not to misuse sexuality. The third of the grave precepts. Dogen responds to this, I, responds to, I vow not to misuse sexuality that the three wheels of self, object, and action be pure. With nothing to desire, one goes along together with the Buddha. That the three wheels of self, object, and action be pure. With nothing to desire, one goes along together with the Buddhas. As a tricycle does, or actual tricycle, uh, as we had as I had as a child anyway, Buddhist practice depends on the three wheels of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Likewise, the three wheels of self, object, and action, Dogen's words here, are required for an action to take place. In the I love you above, love, the verb, is the action. Until now, celibacy has been unilaterally required of Buddhist monastics. The notable exception has been Buddhist clergy from post-feudal times in Japan, I think in the 1870s <coughs> or 60s, okay. When the government passed, pushed clergy, Zen monks, to get married so they would resemble Protestant clergy in the West. The, the Japanese government noticed all the, all the colonialism that was going on and they wanted to avert, you know, not allow this to take place by showing that we were like you. We in Japan are like the West. And so this is one of the things they did. Okay. <clears throat> one might assume then that 600 years before that, 1890 to uh, uh, 1870 down to 12, uh, 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 1250, um, one might assume that's Dogen's time. Uh, that Dogen was saying, don't have sex. However, Mahayana precepts are applied equally to clergy and laity. And here, the action being brought up is misusing sexuality. In let the three wheels of self, object, and action be pure, Dogen is stressing not using self for one's, not, not using sex, pardon for one's own purposes, whether by having a specific interest in what one can get out of it, or that's the self, or in the object, or in who the object of one desires is, or in the action itself of having sex. Someone romantically involved in the act of making love with no such particular selfish thoughts in mind, the selfish is the important word here, may very well be pure. Let the three wheels of self, object, and action be pure. Okay. 
Having sex in itself, of course, is natural as drinking and peeing, if more targeted in nature for procreation and preservation. With nothing to desire, quoting Hidogen here, one goes along together with the Buddhas, with nothing to desire for laity anyway, is not being attached to getting something for oneself out of the sexual act. Even in making love, being pure would be acting as Buddhas do in whatever situation they are in. The fourth one, and the last one today, for the fourth precept, I vow to refrain from full speech, of course, from lying. Dogen's words are, the Dharma wheel turns from the beginning. The sweet dew saturates all and harvests the truth. That's quite poetic, but a little hard to figure out. But anyway, for I vow to refrain from false speech, <coughs> Dogen said, the Dharma wheel turns from the beginning. The sweet dew saturates all and harvests the truth. The Dharma wheel, Dharma, Dharma chakra uh, in Sanskrit, uh, is a universal symbol of Buddhism. With eight spokes, well, you've seen this, each standing for one of the eight practices of the Noble Eightfold Path. These are right view, first, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Rephrasing this, first the path is found. And once we accept the path, we do the right things with respect to our speech, body, and livelihood. That is with what we say, what we act, and what we work at. And keep at it, that's the, that's the uh, 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 right effort, and keep at it, uh, until we are mindful of moments. And finally, able to concentrate on them. While in one literal sense, the Dharma is what has been passed down to us from Shakyamuni over some thousands of years, the homage paid, er, paid, paid uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, full moon ceremony to that the first Buddha we mentioned is seven Buddhas before Buddha. Then we say Shakyamuni Buddha. And then, then we say Maitreya Buddha. So um, uh, that makes that beginning, but the beginning is not really Shakyamuni Buddha, but seven Buddhas before him. That's a long distance. It's a, 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 apocryphal, you can say, not, not a factual thing. So, so it makes the beginning in the Dharma wheel turns from the beginning, appear less finite. Of course, in Zen we say, what really connects us to Shakyamuni is what has been passed down from warm hand to warm hand. That's why we have the ancestors, the list of ancestors. When you, when you do the Jukai, you, you receive your, you, 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 Buddha's, Buddha's first, and then there's names of all the ancestors right down to you. There is neither surplus nor lack. Remember he, said, he says, um, uh, anyway, neither surplus nor lack itself implies that, dharma, that the Dharma isn't something specific, such as that which is discovered along the path about either form, surplus, or emptiness, lack. Indeed, what Dogen meant with the Dharma wheel turns from the beginning is that the Dharma has always been everywhere. He says this also with the sweet dew saturates all and harvests the truth. The sweet dew is the Dharma. And if harvest the truth is rendered as and truth is its harvest, I don't know if that's possible, but anyway, the reason the Dharma is always here is that living our lives fully is being completely 
and perfectly enlightened. Living our lives fully is to be completely and perfectly enlightened. We may need to accept this on faith now, but the Dharma is always here. And so ultimately, there is no way for us to lie anyway, just as we cannot kill in the first paragraph. Okay, so that's the one for today. Uh, do you have any questions, comments, please? Give me some water, hon. Jane's coming right now. Yes, yes, Mike. There's Paul. Mike? Yeah. Um, when the first precept of not taking what's not given, are you, are you saying that it's mostly like you have to let life come to you, not wanting to, you know, have, a, have an attachment as to how you want results to turn out or what's going on. I wish life was better. I wish people weren't suffering and stuff. But that you really, you're taking something when you try to, to change what's going on. And it's better to let it just come to you and just deal with it as it happens and with a, with a compassionate mind. That's exactly right, Mike. Huh? And the second thing is, I'm finishing up a Brad Warner book called Sex, Sin, and Zen. <laughs> and it's a very good book on the dealing of the abuse of sexuality and stuff. And I recommend it to everybody in his usual blunt, you know, common English way. It's a very good book. But um, I, I still keep getting the impression when we talk, have these Dharma talks, that if you just live your life with compassion and be in the moment and not have ideals and desires drag you around like a dog on a leash that you really are living i don't like using the word enlightenment or satori or anything like that because it taints it but if you just just live your life with compassion that a lot of your problems and worries and stresses and things don't exist anymore that's exactly right. That also is true. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but you, you always summarize really well, Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, Chris? So since the government of Japan sort of, um, you know, heavy-handedly uh, changed the practice of, of Buddhism in the Zen school, and I guess... Uh, and that, that sort of period in history and in, in that place in history is sort of over, I guess, uh, why hasn't Zen gone back to uh, celibacy and non-marriage? Okay, Chris, you're, you're, you're becoming a priest, so I guess you, you ought to stop this, this, no more sex, right? Like that? <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't know. Actually, actually, Chris, not everyone changed. Some people uh, remain celibate, even even in Japan. Uh, so, but most of but and so uh, so we we knew priests who we knew a couple of well at least one priest who was celibate anyway uh, when when we were there not not as an priest uh, but that's all yeah they were they, I mean uh, the fact is probably a lot of them were really happy to, to be able to to do it that way I, I, I would guess so. They didn't really suffer too much from it. <laughs> Good idea, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, though, that there's multiple different approaches to sexuality as a human, and it's not incompatible with monasticism or with clerginess, for lack of a better word. Well, anyway, for us, yes, that's too true. If we talk to another sect, like uh, like Theravada Buddhism, for example, uh, not Vipassana in the modern time, but Theravada, yeah, they don't, they're, they're celibate. But, but of course, you know, there's some, there's some similar things to, um, uh, to Christianity, or, well, to, to Catholicism also, because, you know, you, you, you can't support a family. You know, I mean, I mean, Buddhists, Buddhists, you know, always, you know, didn't raise food and, until they came to China. Uh, and so they depended upon uh, people g 
giving food to them. And you, you couldn't go, go around asking for food for your wife and kids. Because people are poor. We are not poor, but people are we're poor. We're not, always poor. Paul? Um, also, my understanding was that before the, the, the uh, government made that edict, uh, there, there, was, uh, there was an open door to the local brothel. And there was also people had housekeepers, just like Catholic priests have housekeepers that they have sex with. It's not, it wasn't exactly, there was no sex going on. It's just, they weren't married and there was no family and there was no heir apparent and there was no nepotism in that sense. So it was a political thing as well as a sexual thing. And, and in general, my experience of sex in Japan is quite different than America. And it's not something that there's not, it's not something that we can explain. It's a, it's a culture, very different cultural difference. And that, that it's, it's, um, Anyway, it's, it's it, drawing comparisons to nowadays. We have to find our own way today. There's no, the, what, what, what people did in the past is not going to help us a whole lot in uh, figuring out what to do today. Yeah, well, well what, what Paul said is true. We're, we're Jane, Jane and I lived in a temple town, you might say, literally, literally a temple town. And, there, and, there, uh, and uh, five miles away, there was a brothel that had been moved by the government, but it actually had been in the town before. Yeah, so they, they, they didn't take having sex and having a family as the same thing. Yeah, that's another whole story, but uh, that's how they interpreted it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You don't have this plugged in. I don't have it plugged in? No, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't plug in the speaker at the time. Yes, Mike. In my studies, I've found that when I studied celibacy and Christianity and Buddhism and stuff, it seemed to be mostly the whole thing was it was a distraction from the path. And it could really disrupt your, your attention to what you were doing. And so that's why a lot of times they would rule out, you know, they would say no sex or nothing like that. Not because it was a sin or was against the rules or against anything. It's just it has a very powerful impact on your body and your mind, and it can distract you from your your path. And so it was easier just to say, "Look, don't get carried away by that because it'll distract you. It'll take you off your journey, and it's just it gets in the way." <laughs> I don't know if that's correct, but that was the impression I got from my studies. Sure, 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 sure. That's, I'm, I'm sure that's true. And, and, and not just priesthood. If, if you were studying to do kendo or, or some martial art or some kind of, or some, any, any kind of thing where you had to like really practice a lot, generally people would not have any, the, the idea was you wouldn't have sex while you're, while you're, while you're practicing like that because it's, it's a distraction and it takes your energy and various things. It's, it's, um, it's almost like, like, like eating more protein or something. It's, it's more of a practical thing. It's not the moralistic kind of thing that we, that we get into in this culture so much. It's more of a practical, like, that's not, you know, you, you need to save your energy for doing whatever, whatever activity it is that you're doing. Um, it's, 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 it's different. <laughs> it's not, it's not like, not like we have, we, we have made such a big thing about love and marriage and sexuality and putting women on a pedestal, turning them into objects. And we've just done such a whole trip on it in this society that it's hard to imagine that, that there's an other, other ways of looking at it. Okay, yes, okay. Thank you, Paul. Oh, yes, Chris. Just another thought is, it seems like um, sex is kind of like fear in that um, it is, Basically, there's almost zero potential to avoid making two where sex is involved or where fear is involved that and I'm sure other uh, experiences um, where basically it's 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 almost inconceivable to engage in that activity or to experience that um, and not fall into dual duality. Could be. Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. 
<laughs> Armin, look at you, nice, nice smile on your face. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else here today? I can go back to bed. <laughs> oh my, Joel, 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 Joel. Hi. Sorry to um, prevent you from going back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you feel better. Oh, I will. Um, no, thank you, though. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to throw in here. It was uh, this thing with Mel because Jerry Oliva gave a Dharma talk after Mel died, and she said that she visited him, you know, to give. Um, you know, relief. Um, and that one time she was there. And you know, at the very end, it was very hard for him to speak. Um, and he just said, sex and Dharma don't mix. That's one thing he said. Really? Okay. Yeah. Another occasion, uh, she was there. And he said, everything is love. <laughs> and so, uh of course you know he he according to jerry he said sex and dharma don't mix but in his own life obviously he tried to make them mix yeah. and um and you know he enjoyed it yeah um and in his students there's never been a thing where he said you know you really should you know he was definitely in favor of sex as a good thing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think it's very, um, I just wanted to bring that up as long as we're on the topic. And it's kind of, in a way, a koan for me. Um, he saw the, I think what people have been saying, like it, I mean, sex is so huge and powerful that it could distract and dharma is huge and powerful um and uh all consuming and so uh and the two and i mean like we say sex divides people but sex brings us all utterly together you know when we're you know, when we're doing it, and there's the real love there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to make of it. But um, I just thought since we're on the topic, I could bring that up. And sure, sure. Offer sure. that sure. as one of Mel's last teachings. And I don't know <laughs> what, what exactly he might have meant by it. But um, it sort of uh, Jerry didn't try to uh, make sense of it, but she offered it to us. So Thank you, thank you, thank you, Joanne. Jane, is it? Jane, I see some Jane. Joanne. Joanne. So I, I was just thinking about um, the precept about uh, do not take what is not given, and in a reverse <laughs> way, like for example, you know we. Uh, there's a lot of times where we are expecting something to come forward and we get something else, <laughs> but we're still trying to get what we thought we would, what, what, what we thought we would be getting in the first place. Right. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was kind of observing it in that way. Like, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, you do something and you get a, a different reaction maybe than what you expected. Um, but you know part of this part of uh do not take what is not given is being with what presents itself as it is and uh not trying to take some alternative version of it sure you know not just like uh not just do not steal but um you know, trying to trying to get something other than what you got. That's right. That's right. Hmm? 
Any, anything else, anybody? We are, um, uh, Jean? Yeah, I'll say something. Yeah. I'm reading a book right now of uh, Trungpa Rinpoche's uh, uh, last words or last teachings, and they were Vajrayana teachings. And uh, my sister sent it as a present uh, to Peter one year, and it sat in our bookshelf with nobody reading it for <laughs> about three or four years. And uh, I picked it up and started reading it finally because uh, I was interested in what he had to say. And all of his talk about it is the union of male and female, the male principle and the female principle, and how it permeates every part of practice in many different ways. And uh, there is no uh, elimination of either one because both of them are absolutely necessary to make uh, the practice and the teachings complete. So uh, it's really different from the kind of teachings we have getting into. I think we have a kind of puritanical background so that we either go crazy with <coughs> one direction or crazy with the other direction. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what Tibetan teachings are as far as it being perfect and good, but I think probably the teaching that uh, the male principle and the female principle are absolutely necessary to be balanced between each other in every way for it to be a complete teaching is really important. And so I, I don't find any difference, you know, with the uh, temples and the brothel being so close to each other that it doesn't make any difference to me. And, and I don't, it seems to me to be very natural. And uh, it, it sort of fell into a relationship of how to balance the society at that time. And uh, where we lived, there was an enormous section down by the lake where the brothel was quite large and very big. And it was associated with hot springs and all kinds of fancy things. And, and uh, but I think probably uh, more help goes on between men and women and priests and women and others than we're aware of. And a lot of it is of a healing nature. And I don't mean that the priests were down there healing the prostitutes, but probably it was happening the other way around as well. So <laughs> I, I think that probably these, uh, our mind which separates male and female so extremely or separates uh, uh, sex and no sex so extremely is the real problem for us. And that they're left to itself is quite natural and not separated at all. And it's our thinking that separates it and makes it so terrible. That's what I wanted to say. So I think the more they're balanced, the better it is. Paul? Um, I, I, I think you're right on, Jane. I think you're, you're not really on top of it. But I wanted to say something about koans. About when a teacher says something to a student, we have to remember that that's that teacher talking to that student. It's not, he's not expressing a universal truth. He's expressing something that is a relationship to that student. So if we think, we think of that, if we hear about somebody saying something in all the koans, the written ones and the, and the modern day ones, if we think of that they are somehow the, the, the expression of truth, we will get in big trouble. It's only, it's only, it's understand the teacher speaking to the student. And, and that relationship that, that makes the difference. Um, I think it, it's, it's, it's hard for us to forget that because we're always looking for, always looking for the answer somewhere and, and, and it's not to be found in that location. Yeah. Joanne? Madonna? And Audrey? Um, yeah, I just, I just thought about some wisdom from my niece's kindergarten class, you know, in terms of like, uh, do not take what is not given. Is uh, in her kindergarten class, they said, "You get what you get, and you don't get upset." <laughs> very, very simple. Very nice, yeah. <laughs> and you don't get upset. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. right on. Yeah. <laughs>